Hello to everybody that's joining us, our shareholders. Thank you for attending. My name is Anthony Malat. I'm president and CEO of Sea Alaska. Gunnuk Yuchat Duisap. My Klingit name is Gunnuk. I'm Tsag Uh I'm really excited about the information that we are sharing today. Uh, I hope you had a chance to review the session we had last week. Uh, a lot of work is going into the opportunities presented and the information we're sharing from our shareholder development team, Tesla Cox and, and Kayla Roberts, and a lot of input and support as well from our communications and community outreach team led by Matt Carl. So I'll start by thanking them uh, for putting this information together. Uh, but really thank all of you for being willing to hear the opportunities we're presenting and continuing to reach out to us. Uh, we get better when we hear from our shareholders. We put better programs together when we hear from you, uh, not only individual shareholders, but family members who are presenting what, what their children or their nieces or nephews are looking for either in an educational opportunity or a career opportunity. I, I want to start uh, by saying that last week we did highlight existing programs. So we spent some time on our scholarship program and our intern program. And those were important, very important to highlight because we were hitting some deadlines uh, and some application deadlines for both programs. So didn't want shareholders to miss out. Uh, so we will provide replays and some additional information on both of these events. But today we, we are really focused on new programs that again, our development team is either building and putting together or working with partner entities to present uh, new opportunities to our shareholders. And there are opportunities again that that we have heard from our shareholders, this is what we're looking for. And we are presenting these opportunities based off of your voice. I wanna quickly spend some time on um, a document and I hope I can find it. Um, yes, I think, I think I can get this. And this is a strategic high level document that, that really guides the direction of both our shareholder development team and our community outreach team, along with myself, our board, our business partners. And it, it describes the programs that we are presenting today. So we, we've put a lot of effort in describing our global ocean health business and what that presents, the financial results being created and the long-term focus of ocean health, both in our businesses and for our communities. And the, the session last week and this week are presenting some of the programs that our Sea Alaska Outreach and Development teams are putting together. And again, they are focused on bringing programs and initiatives that benefit our communities and shareholders based off of shareholder priorities. And I mentioned last week that development, education, workforce training, career, leadership development have all been top shareholder priorities. And that's why we're so focused on these efforts. But we know we can't do it all alone. We can't develop every program that our shareholders are asking for. So that's why we find partners who have a shared vision of building training, building leadership um, in individuals that we have, we align our strategies, we find the funding, we support those partners. Sometimes we build the programs with them. And when we do that, we have more programs, they're better programs and we create better outcomes. We're excited about presenting more of this strategy to our shareholders. There's going to be more communication about this. 
And I hope that you see, based off of you know, following us at mycalaska.com, we have an opportunities section that highlights and reiterates these opportunities. I hope you start following that more actively and sharing it uh, and seeing that we are trying to present more opportunities to our shareholder base. The first program that we are going to present has been built by our development team in coordination with our global ocean health business. Uh, we have a strong business partner who is working with our internal team to present a program that we really believe fits uh, two distinct shareholder requests. We have many shareholders who aren't looking for a nine to five job. Uh, some have called it a lifestyle compatible job. Maybe they're traditional harvesters in our communities. Maybe they have other responsibilities, but they want an income source that fits their lifestyle and fits their skill set. And I think, I hope you'll see that, that the opportunity presented does fit that, that sort of request from our shareholders. But it also fits a request from shareholders for a good entry level job for fisheries management, for environmental sciences, uh, which we have a lot of interest from our shareholder base. And so the first opportunity we are going to jump in to, uh, I believe fits both of those requests. And I'll, I'll come back uh, and highlight some additional opportunities, a video from one of our partners that is more focused on the opportunities that we are working with our partners with. But this first opportunity is an internally led effort. And I'm just excited about the work that went into this from our development team. Thank you, Tesla. And I will go ahead and kick it off. I'll stop sharing and kick it off to our partner, Sasha. Uh, who will present, introduce herself and present this first opportunity. Finnick Cheesh. Hi, everyone. I'm Sasha. I'm with Gretti Associates. I'm based in Tacoma, Washington. And thank you all so much for being here today. Uh, I'm going to share my slideshow. Let me know if that's what you see. Anthony, does that look right to you? <laughs> yes. Okay, perfect, thanks. Um, I'm gonna make sure to keep the chat open also. So if anybody has any questions along the way, I'd be happy to answer them. So yeah, thank you all so much for being here today. I'm so excited with, uh, for about this opportunity to work with you and interact with you all. Uh, today, I'm gonna be talking about protected species observers uh, as a career. And also we're gonna be offering a two-day training to get anybody who wants to be certified um, certified as a protected species observer. I'm gonna use the term PSO because it's less of a mouthful today. Uh, you may also have heard of it being called marine mammal observers or MMOs. So it's a similar thing. Uh, a little bit about myself. I am from Colorado, but now live in Tacoma, Washington. And I have been a professional PSO for years. I started in 2005 working on a dredge in North Carolina. Then I did helicopter and land-based PSOing I don't think that's really a word, but I'm gonna use it anyway, <laughs> in Cook Inlet, Alaska, and then did boat-based work in Cook Inlet for seismic exploration, and then got to work for an eight-year, eight or nine-year program called the Chuck G. C. Environmental Studies Program, working about 100 miles offshore in the Arctic, doing marine mammal surveys as part of a joint venture between Conoco, Shell, and Statoil, who all were interested maybe in looking for oil in that area and they wanted to get a baseline idea of what lived there first. So it was a really cool ecosystem uh, wide program that studied, as I say, I was on the marine mammal team. We did seabird surveys, also benthic and plankton surveys. <clears throat> and uh, I see the link is not working. I hope that's not to what we're talking about right now. Anyway, um, so I also then, so I spent lots of time offshore on boats and then ended up doing some land monitoring, some land-based monitoring again on the Chukchi coast um, for a seawall project. So a lot of my work has been in the Alaskan Arctic or Cook Inlet, although also in the North Atlantic, and I've done some humpback research in Hawaii as well. 
Through all this time, I've had the opportunity to work with many village elders from the Alaska Native communities in the North Slope and hold some of those interactions as my most treasured moments of my life. So I'm really looking forward to interacting and working with Alaska shareholders. Every one of us is a product of what and who came before us. We here in Tacoma work and live on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, and our office sits on traditional homelands of the Puyallup tribe. We recognize that this land acknowledgement is one small step toward allyship with the tribes, and we honor and respect the voices, experiences, histories, and land of the indigenous people of this land and beyond. In putting together this presentation, I wanted to include photos demonstrating the life and work of protected species observers. The majority of the photos you're gonna see are my own, with some from Gretty also, my company, and others are credited if they aren't ours. The opportunities for once in a lifetime experiences in this profession are unmatched. So why PSOs? As we all know, I believe, uh, marine species face a variety of threats, including habitat loss and alteration, historic mismanagement through overharvesting or illegal harvesting, contaminants, climate change, and ocean noise, just to name a few. Our job is to do what we can to reduce and mitigate these threats. This slide shows several protected species. The top left is Cook Inlet Belugas, that population is critically endangered. The top middle is a southern resident orca killer whale from Puget Sound here. Then we have some Pacific walruses. They are candidate species to be listed. Bottom left, we have Chinook salmon. Puget Sound Chinook are endangered. Humpback whales, they're endangered or threatened depending on which stock you look at. And the bottom right one I included because it's a success story of um, the Endangered Species Act working. Bald eagles who are no, no longer listed under the Endangered Species Act. So the Endangered Species Act was passed in 1973. The purpose of it was to prevent extinction of species and to recover species to the point where the law's protections are no longer needed. This act protects any endangered species across any taxa and their ecosystems. The five that I have listed here are examples of species in our area. Again, I'm in Tacoma, so this is the Puget Sound Pacific Northwest area. So we have reptiles represented by leatherback sea turtles, birds represented by marbled murelet, plants by golden paintbrush, insects by the Taylor's checker spot butterfly, and humpback whales. Again, all five of these are protected under the Endangered Species Act. Another act that is in place to protect species is the Marine Mammal Protection Act. This one was passed in 1972 with the purpose of preventing marine mammal species and population stocks from declining beyond the point at which they cease to be significant functioning elements of their ecosystems. Similar to the ESA, except the MMPA is to protect all marine mammals. And this is regardless of population status at this point. So this is all seals and sea lions. This picture is a little bearded seal in the Chukchi Sea. Any toothed whales, odontocetes. This one is not a southern resident killer whale, it's just a transient killer whale. So not protected under the ESA, but yes, under the MMPA. All baleen whales, again, gray whales, not protected under the ESA, but yes, under the MMPA. And then polar bears, walruses, and sea otters also, and manatees are also all protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. So the protections that these acts offer, the way that they're offered, I suppose, is project proponents will apply for permits to conduct their actions. Their applications include information about the proposed project and an analysis of how that project may affect any protected species in the area or their habitats. We're under the flight pattern for um, the base here, so I'm sorry if you hear big planes flying overhead <laughs> while I'm talking. <laughs> the agencies will review the application and they either deny or issue the permits based on the analyses. Projects that require permits include, this one is picture, pictured is uh, geophysical surveys. This is how they look for oil. So energy exploration, including wind or geophysical. Um, it, if they're installing wind turbines, that can be a noisy uh, action. 
So air guns pictured here are used to project pressurized air vertically through the substrate towards the bottom of the water. Hydrophones record the way the sound echoes and they can reveal pockets of different density materials such as oil. The sound can penetrate up to 20 miles down into the sediment. As you can imagine, that sound is very loud. Other projects include construction. Pile driving and blasting both are permitted, require permits because of underwater noise or water quality issues. Dredging can be on the list for a few reasons also depending on the type of dredging. It can be a water quality issue where it um, makes the water turbid, silty, and that's not great for fish. Or in some situations, they uh, will barge the, dredge, the dredged material to an offshore dump site. And for my first job on a dredge boat, we had to transit through an area that was a North Atlantic right whale habitat, and they're a critically endangered species. So I was on board to make sure we didn't encounter any of them. Also with dredging, sometimes they'll have observers on board. If there are species that live on or near the bottom that could be scooped up in the dredge. So sturgeon are an example of that as well. Another time you'll have a permit issued will be for science. Scientific studies may require one if the project proponent is going to be approaching or sampling protected species. So when a permit is issued, the agencies publish a biological opinion that confirms that they review the analysis of potential impacts and they don't believe that the project will jeopardize the continued existence of the species or the habitat. They also assess the likelihood of the protected species being subjected to the project, and then they issue take. Take is the number of permissible, quote, harassment events. They define harassment as something that changes the behavior of a species, of an individual. So if a whale is swimming one way and it hears a boom and it turns around and turns the other way, that is a harassment event. So the agencies, as part of their analysis, will assess the likelihood of the species being subjected to the project, and then they issue take. In some cases, they may determine that some take, like I just described that harassment, is okay. For example, if a harbor seal, which are, is very common, and uh, also not very selective about prey, where they eat and what they eat, so if they're swimming up a river and there's a loud boom and they turn around, they might just go eat a fish under a rock someplace else. If however, say a Cook Inlet beluga is swimming up inlet to get to a river mouth where they can feed on eulicon, a very specific prey at a very specific location, and there's a loud boom and they turn around and go the other direction, that could be really bad for the species. If you start having um, animals that aren't breeding anymore because they're too disrupted by the activity. So anyway, take is issued. Uh, and so they may say, you, it's okay if 100 harbor seals change direction, but not okay if even one beluga whale does. So this is where we come in. Protected species observer's job is to visually survey a predetermined project area for protected species, and then notify the contractor to stop work if we have a sighting. Our job is to ensure that the work gets done within the confines of the permit, which means with the minimal adverse impacts to protected species. Alternatively, if you're lucky enough to get on a job doing biological surveys, you might just be collecting data, just be keeping an eye out and writing down everything that you see. Because the monitoring is visual, the most common species we monitor for are marine mammals. Sea turtles may also be on our list but for example, fish are a little more tricky. Marbled murelets are another species that can be monitored for. However, that requires a special separate marbled murelet monitoring training. So some of the locations where you may find PSO work includes just locally, if it's construction work. I think a lot of you are in Southeast Alaska, for example. Uh, anybody that's working on the coast around cities or ports, a lot of what we do is for ports that have to maintain their infrastructure. I think in Juneau and Sitka and those areas, you have cruise traffic that comes. And so cruise ship terminals or cargo terminals or fishing terminals, things like that. You have to maintain the, the structure, the infrastructure. So we'll be replacing pile, which requires putting some noise into the water. 
So that could be day work just locally. Also in Alaska, as I say, I've worked up in the Arctic and in Cook Inlet, uh, never worked in Southeast, but would love to. Also work in the North Pacific. There's talk of wind farms happening. Drilling is another time that you may need if it's a offshore drilling. The North Atlantic is doing wind work now. The Gulf of Mexico has done a lot of seismic work. Same in the Indian Ocean. Platforms you may find yourself working aboard or on include boats. They can be very large boats, um, including like NOAA ships that are huge. I worked on a boat that has 10 levels and requires an elevator to get to the bridge with a helicopter landing pad on it, and also on our little 19 foot uh, aluminum boat. The picture here is the boat that we used for that Chukchi Sea Environmental Studies program, and that was a 160 foot crabber in the Chukchi. Also, you can work on land. You can be land-based in remote areas or in metropolitan areas like downtown Seattle, or from the air, which can be by helicopter or fixed wing aircraft. The life of an observer depends on which kind of observing you're doing. Often construction work is just day work. And that's because often the permits come with stipulations that you have to you can only work during daylight hours, for example, if there are noise ordinances in cities, or depending on the species that are being observed or protected. Uh, for example, marbled murelets have a nesting season, and during that season, they tend to be more active at dawn and dusk, so they're not allowed to work until two hours after dawn and have to stop two hours before dusk. So construction and local work often can be just day work. Still sometimes really long days, but you get to go home at night. Other jobs can be prolonged stints, sometimes 30 to 120 days away from home. That can be offshore on a boat or working in a small remote camp. Those days often are 12 hours on, 12 hours off, seven days a week. Eyes on the water during all operations. You'll work in inclement weather and bad sea conditions live in camps such as this one pictured here. This was a camp I lived in for a while or, on, uh, or communally on boats in tight quarters. And it can be a really high stress job and life. So the work carries with it a serious responsibility of making difficult calls to protect the target species. When you see this, these are walruses starting to gather just offshore. And you know that this is what's coming these are walruses now that have hauled out on land in our work area. It requires notifying project managers that their job may have to be shut down for a week or more, which is a really expensive call to make. So our job requires integrity and the ability to make tough decisions and the ability to work under pressure. But also it means you get to experience seeing thousands of walruses hauling out along their migration route south. And the training course that we're gonna teach will equip you with the tools necessary for handling these situations. The rewards that come with it, like I mentioned, are pretty great. For one thing, the pay is reasonably good. For some of those longer stint offshore jobs, starting can be $200 a day or more, and then a more experienced observer, $400 or more dollars a day. You also have a once in a lifetime experiences like seeing a sow and a cub polar bear swimming to an ice floe or a white deer falcon landing on the boat in the middle of the Chukchi Sea or a walrus hiding on an ice floe. You also will make lifelong friendships because it takes a certain kind of person to be willing to go be hovering around on, a, on the water in the middle of nowhere for four weeks together. And for me, I also have really enjoyed the opportunity to make a difference in that we all rely on this infrastructure that I was talking about, whether it's for our own local economies or the national economy. And so the opportunity to be the one keeping an eye out and keeping these species safe, for me, has made it a really rewarding career. Minimum qualifications to do this work include visual acuity in both eyes. You have to be able to see uh, with binoculars or glasses is fine. Either advanced education in biological science or similar or the equivalent Alaska Native traditional, traditional knowledge. 
uh, experience and ability to conduct field observations and collect data according to assigned protocols. This says this may include academic experience. Yesterday, we were also talking, I was talking with Anthony just about, again, traditional ecological knowledge and the amount of time that you all likely have spent out harvesting or hunting or fishing and um, collecting data through observation, whether writing it down or not. And that's something that uh, we really liked that, that the parallels will work really well, I think very nicely with this. Also, you need experience or training in field identification of marine mammals. Same, uh, same comment. Sufficient training, orientation, or experience with vessel operation and pile driving operations to provide for personal safety during observations. This is something you'll get from your contractor when you get to the job. They'll have a, an orientation meeting and tell you where you can and can't go and what uh, PPE, what personal protective equipment you'll need for those jobs. Writing skills sufficient to prepare a report of observations. Now, normally your project lead will end up writing the report and you may end up needing to just communicate clearly an incident that you saw through email or write it down. Keeping really good notes is great for this job. Also the ability to communicate orally by radio or in person with project personnel to provide real-time information on marine mammals observed in the area as needed. So in our course, the topics that we're gonna cover are our purpose in a little more detail, expectations for participation by PSOs on the job, the background for legislations and agencies responsible for implementation, overview of protected species in the area, basic marine mammal biology, basic understanding of underwater noise. I'm really excited about the traditional ecological knowledge portion uh, for species in Southeast Alaska or wherever you come from. Um, you have tricks for identifying species, things like that, That's or um, an idea of when to expect certain species to come through based on time of year or weather or, you know, fish runs or things like that. That's the stuff that's really exciting for me to learn about. We'll also be going over how to collect good data, how to use monitoring equipment like reticle binoculars, clinometers, range finders, computers, data sheets. We'll talk about distance estimation and species identification. Opportunities beyond PSOing places that this can lead include work in conservation, environmental consulting and permitting, which is what I do now, fisheries management, scientific research, also I do some of that, outreach and education, teaching. It can lead you to take up schoolings or do work towards advanced degrees. It can lead to publications or presentations at scientific conferences. I've done that using data collected during my PSO work and also citizen science where maybe you could work with a group that every, the first of every month goes out and does a harbor seal survey in a specific area and you could be the person that does your area. So our training will be February 17th and 18th. It's a Thursday and a Friday from nine to five. That might end up being wiggly. It might be, or we might end earlier than that. We'll see when the agenda is all worked out. But afterwards you will be a National Marine Fishery Service certified observer for land or vessel-based work, for construction projects in the Pacific Northwest and Alaska, basically Cook Inlet and Southeast. So we're not gonna be covering seismic work or offshore prolonged work. We're not gonna be covering species outside of this area. And it's gonna be on Zoom, so it can happen right from the comfort of your own home. With that, I've seen the chat saying some things, but I haven't been reading them, but if anybody has questions or wants to chat about it, I'm available, would love that. I'll also jump in here. We have on Facebook Live and Zoom, we have our team um, publishing the link where you can register. Registration will be open until two days before the event. And this is open, <clears throat> sorry, for shareholders and their families, for spouses, descendants to attend um, in any community. So this is, there's work all along the coast. So wherever you are, um, check it out, encourage your family, your 
you know, nieces, nephews, grandchildren to uh, check out mycalaska.com for more um, information on opportunities. It looks like we have some questions here. Great. Minnesota is a hot zone for bird migration. Is there certification with an affiliate that targets the Midwest? That is a great question. How about I look into that and get back to you? Because certainly there is there are observers. That would be a bird, probably more migratory bird act um, question. So I would be happy to look into that and I can let Tesla and Tesla know and she can share that with you. We also have a survey that you can complete to be eligible for door prizes, but there's a section in there for questions and we're going to work on putting up an event recap after this. So if you have questions, we can answer them there and get those um, posted for you. We have another question from Facebook. What job opportunities come post certification? Also a good question. Um, so these, part of what was exciting about this, I think for Anthony and Alaska is that if I understand correctly, you sometimes have construction work that you, contracts. So then Alaska could provide their own observers for that. I remember I was working uh, on a job where they were talking about rebuilding a bridge in Ketchikan, which would require, would, require pile driving. I think that was just in the last year or two. So things like that would be um, easy, I think, an easy kind of nexus for uh, you all to work into. There are also, as I mentioned, there's some, um, we could talk about, so the, the intention with this was to train you for that sort of opportunity, local construction work. From that, however, or we can talk more about uh, maybe offering an expansion pack to this, where you do learn about the Atlantic, because there is um, some wind stuff going on in the Atlantic that's more consistent work if you're looking for being offshore for months at a time and that sort of thing. I don't know if that answered your question, but I think Tesla and I will also get together and post uh, available PSO jobs. We also, also have a question. Oh, sorry. if you're in the Seattle area, we should also talk about um, we get a lot, my company gets a lot of uh, PSO work and it might be great to have a list of people that are certified around here that we could call on for just we have three weeks of observing in October who's free we have great. another question from Martha Gallagher how can I apply from out of state and Martha that link will be posted in the chat and will also be available on my C Alaska and you can apply from anywhere in any state for any shareholder or family I think that's it for questions. I think that's, I'll just chime in and say that that's extra. That's really great that see Alaska that you're offering this opportunity. These trainings, you'll see them. If you Google protected species observer training, they're like $450 a person um, to do them just regularly throughout the country. So this is a really exciting, great opportunity. Thank you, Sasha. Awesome. Thank you very, thank you very much, Sasha. <laughs> Appreciate no both the presentation and your willingness to do follow up as well. I'm sure there's going to be additional questions. Uh, no doubt this isn't for everybody, uh, but it would, it's unique enough and interesting enough. And we heard from enough shareholders that this could be an interesting opportunity. And, and we want to provide more information if you are interested. And Sasha was right, we do have uh, marine construction entities that do a lot of the work that she described. Uh, we have marine science entities that are focused on offshore wind energy development, and there would be need for PSOs on that work as well. So definitely uh, an opportunity to work directly for a Sea Alaska company, but I think the opportunity longer term is anybody interested in those career fields uh, this is a great entry level job and again the ability for a traditional harvester who has that skill set that Sasha described the observation skill set the ability to observe and be on the water comfortably uh, if you have that skill set and you have the chance to to be an observer for three weeks and then go back home 
um, be an observer for two weeks and then go back home. I think I think it's an opportunity that could be beneficial and bring uh, additional income to our traditional harvesters. For so for all those reasons, we are presenting this opportunity and. Tesla and Sasha and team will just continue to answer questions and and uh, hopefully motivate and inspire um, a good amount of you to take on this opportunity. So now we'll transition to a video. And I mentioned at the beginning that uh, this was an internal opportunity. So a lot of the information uh, and questions just keep those coming in to Tesla and our team, they will get them answered. Uh, but the next opportunity is from one of our partner entities and it is for a entry level opportunity for a, com a commercial fishing career. I grew up commercial fishing. My father was a commercial fisherman. My brother still is a commercial fisherman. So many of our employees and our board directors at Sea Alaska have deep and long connection to commercial fishing. But we do see that access to commercial fishing as a industry or a career is getting more difficult for many. It, it may be there's not as many boats in your communities fishing. Uh, and, and we want to, we think it's a good career. We think there's opportunities for shareholders who, who have again an uncle or a parent that had fished and, and want to see if it's a if it's an if it's an opportunity that fits what they want it fits our communities very well our, our traditional communities uh, but there's just not as many opportunities but less boats in our in our traditional communities so the program that we're presenting is for a deckhand almost apprentice like opportunity to be on a commercial commercial vessel as a deckhand, build your skills, being on the water, knowing where to fish, knowing the gear, uh, you know, learning from an experienced captain. And it offers the chance to then either one, decide if you, it may be not for, for you, um, being a deckhand, just like a PSO, it's time on the water away from family. It can be very rewarding, but it is difficult. So it just gives, uh, you a chance, our shareholders a chance to experience commercial fishing, decide if it's something that they want to dive into further. Uh, and again, Tesla, myself, Kayla can answer questions, but our partner Alpha, who's put a lot of thought into this program, uh, designed it in a manner that I think is very thoughtful. Uh, they also are, will be available for questions and we will support uh, Q&A even after the video we share. So uh, thank you for Tesla for working uh, with Alpha, Matt uh, for working with Alpha to present this opportunity. Hi, I'm Linda Benkin. I'm executive director of the Alaska Longline Fishermen's Association. And now Hi, I'm Linda Benkin. I'm executive director of the Alaska Longline Fishermen's Association. And Natalie Sattler is with me here today to talk about our crew apprentice program. Natalie is the program director for our young fishermen's programs. We really appreciate this chance to talk to you all about our program and really look forward to including more of you who are listening today in our crew apprentice program or any of our other young fishermen programs that we offer. Our young fishermen work really grew out of an awareness that our fleet was overall aging, that we were seeing less people coming into the fisheries, and that we had skippers who were having a hard time finding crew. And that wonderfully came together with one of our skippers who used to be a teacher and loves teaching, uh, who had historically fished with his family his family was ready to move on to running their own boats or retire from fishing. And he got interested in taking young people for first time out in the ocean 
with a real focus on having them learn about fishing and learn in a safe environment, um, but become professional crew. So, so he, we worked with one skipper first to place young people who are interested in fishing with that, with that focus that we want you to love fishing, we want you to be safe and feel comfortable out on the water for the first time, um, but get a taste of what fishing is really all about. And at the same time, understand how much care we take of the fish that we catch and our commitment to taking care of the ocean as part of what we do. Uh, that quickly grew that we had more young people interested in going fishing than Eric Jordan on the I got it could accommodate. So we started a program where we train other skippers, we prepare young people when they apply and we match them up to try and get people out on the water, whether they can do it for a few weeks, a few days, or hopefully a full season and make it their profession. So that's a little bit of the background. We've been running this program now for almost 10 years. Um, and I'm going to let Natalie tell you a little bit more about the specifics and how the program will operate this season um, as we start to open the application process. Okay, thanks, Linda. Um, so as Linda said, I'm the program director for Alaska Long Island Fishermen's Association and um, help out with the crew training program. And we are um, have just opened our application period for the 2022 season. And applications are available on our website at alphafish.org. Um, and anyone that's interested can click on the link and apply. Um, we encourage people to apply as soon as possible. Um, it helps us to sort of start matching crew members that have applied and that we've vetted and approved to the program with some of our approved skippers as well. And to speak to that, we have um, a a list of skippers that we work with from year to year, but we spend a lot of time um, getting to know them, checking out just their past references, um, talking to them about safety and patience and working with new crew members on their boat. And then we provide training for those skippers. Um, and then in addition to our applicants that are accepted into the program, we do provide training as well. We provide a curriculum that we send, a lot of resources, information about just being on boats in general, we also share information on courses that are provided by AMSI that may help people prepare to be out on the water. And then once we have matched um, our applicants with a skipper, um, the skipper spent a lot of time sort of introducing our crew, crew training folks to um, the boat and what life is like on the boat and getting them ready to go out on the water. And as Linda mentioned, we do provide um, options for a short term if you're just interested in going out for a couple of days or a week um, or a month or even the full season. And we work with people on um, boats that either are long line or trolling or seining. There's lots of different opportunities. So if there's a particular type of fishery that our applicants are interested in, we do our best to match those people up with the skippers that are doing that fishery. And oftentimes people will have the opportunity to work with a variety of different fisheries throughout the season too. Um, in addition to that, um, we um, just do a lot of communication with folks prior to and then throughout the season. And then we follow up at the end of the year just to see how it all went. Um, we're really excited to work with more folks within the Southeast region and locally um, and really encouraging young folks 18 and over to um, apply and ask any questions that they might have about the program. Um, if you have any further questions or want to learn more, you can contact me at program.director at alphafish.org and or you can call me at 907-738-1286. I'm happy to answer any questions and we hope we can help get the word out and get more folks out there applying to this program. I think that's it. Thanks so much, Natalie. Right, thank you. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. All right. Take care.
Thank you. Our representatives from Alaska Longline Fishermen's Association were not able to be here today. They're in another meeting, but this is a great opportunity. We're really excited to partner with them. Um, we've partnered with them in the past on uh, different programs. So if you have questions, the contact information for them will be in the chat and you can reach out to them, call, email and check out their website. They also have different programs available um, through them and their partners. So our next, we'll also have more information on mycelaska.com slash opportunities. Probably tomorrow we'll work on getting this event recap up with all of the links and information. Um, our next participants are from UAS. They are going to share about their scholarships and tech career opportunities. So I'm not sure which of you wants to go first, but we have um, Dave, Casey, and Tyler. I'm happy to go. Hi, Dave. Hey, how's it going? Good, welcome. Yeah, thank you. I wanna uh, start by uh, thanking you, Tesla, for having me to this gathering. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Anthony, who's on the advisory committee for the scholarships that I'll I'll talk about here in just a sec. Uh, can I share my screen? Yeah, you're all set. Cool. Okay, so uh, the reason that I'm I'm here today is to uh, just briefly mention some scholarships that we have uh, that are brand new and. Uh, we think a really good opportunity uh, for students who are interested in a degree in science or mathematics here at uh, UAS in Juneau on Akwan Ani. So uh, the scholarships are available to students who might want to major in biology, marine biology, fisheries, environmental resources, environmental sciences, or math. So a wide array of math and science degree programs. And the bottom line is that these are needs-based scholarships. So they scale with need and the average scholarship value is uh, over $6,000 per year, up to $10,000 per year for four years. So it's a pretty generous scholarship. Uh, we provide a number of other things to help students find a career path and uh, obtain internships that will lead to career pathways in those fields. Um, key bit that I wanna mention is that the application for this scholarship and also to apply to UAS is February 15th. So that's coming up here just in a couple weeks. Uh, I'll also just briefly mention some of the jobs that our past students have. So you have a feel that for the sorts of jobs you can get with different types of bachelor's degrees in, in that you see up here on this slide. So biology, marine biology, fisheries, um, environmental science, uh, environmental resources, and mathematics. The other thing uh, that I want to mention is that uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody may have about these degree programs. I'll make sure that my contact information, which you see on this slide, gets into the chat box. Um, there's also help applying to UAS uh, from Daniel Carlson, who's involved in our student advising. So uh, I know there's not a whole lot of time. So with that, I'll just say thanks and take any questions that folks may have. Dave, can you say your email again one more time for, for the chat? Yeah, uh, my my email is datalman at alaska.edu. I'll put that into the chat and send it out to uh, everybody. I think. I see a question in the chat from Angelo. Is this a specific, or is this a scholarship specific to shareholders to all of UAS? I can pass the info on if it's the latter. And that's one part is Sea Alaska does have our own scholarship program that is specific to shareholders. 
And the application deadline for that is March 1st. And you can find that information on mycalaska.com. And this is a separate program specific to UAS. Yep, it's open to anybody. It's so it's funding for the National Science Foundation open to anyone uh, native or rural. But our target is, is native students. Thanks for the question. We have a question from Facebook. How many scholarships are available? We anticipate that we'll give out about 10 scholarships this fall, but it'll it, it, it's variable because we don't know exactly how much need each student will have. So there could be slightly fewer or slightly more than that. Good question. We have a question from Paulette. Hi, Dave. Is traditional knowledge credited in these classes? Thank you. Yeah, there is traditional knowledge components in some of those classes. Um, so yes, in some, but it's not necessarily uh, the case across all classes. It varies from class to class. I think that's it. I'm not seeing any more questions come in, but we will also share more information um, over the next week. All right. Thanks. Thanks for the time. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Casey. Hey. Welcome. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Casey Bain. I'm a program advisor at UAS at the UAS School of Career Education. Let me go ahead and get my share screen shared now. Okay. Hopefully, everybody can see that. So again, my name is Casey Bain. Um, I work at the Technical Education Center, which houses the School of Career Education. We're located in Juneau, Alaska, uh, just right across the street from Juneau Douglas High School. A lot of people drive by our buildings. Um, all the time, see the building, don't know what we do here. So I'm, I'm here today to just kind of give a brief rundown. I won't take too much of your time. Um, I'm joined today by Tyler McMichael. Tyler is our advisor for healthcare programs at UAS. He is also employed by the UAA School of Nursing. So we're gonna touch today on some vocational programs that we offer here in Juneau, as well as some healthcare programs. Um, all the programs that, that we teach at Career Education are designed to get you into a career field, designed to get you into a job that's uh, gonna be earning you a living wage. So these are the different fields that we touch upon. We, talk, we touch on boats and trucks in our power technology department, um, construction technology, basically residential construction. And we have a health science welding and a center for mine training. Our center for mine training is, is connected to the hip with our power technology program, what those students are doing is learning how to work on rolling stocks, stock equipment that's out at the mine. So anything that's a dozer, a loader, anything with wheels, anything with tracks, um, we're training students here how to work on that. Um, in connection with, with that Center for Mine Training, we have a Pathway to Mining Careers program that is generously supported by Hecla Greens Creek Mine in Kensington. Um, it's a four-step program that uh, we invite students in high school to join. There's a high school course entitled Introduction to Mining Occupations and Operations. It's actually getting started on March 1st this year. Uh, the course includes a $400 scholarship from Hecla Greens Creek, which for most students, um, covers the entire cost of the course. Now it is on the scholarship is only open to current high school students, but anyone interested in the class is more than welcome to sign up. The bigger scholarship happens after high school. We try to get students from that introductory class and we funnel them into a, a pathway to becoming a diesel mechanic at an underground mine. Hecla Greens Creek provides generous scholarships every semester for six students uh, that provides for the entire cost of tuition. Uh, Kensington actually has an in-house internal program, so this UAS does not control this scholarship, but Kensington is actually paying students to go to school. Um, they're giving them full health care benefits and a wage um, to attend classes in order to become a mechanic. That is how bad, badly needed mechanics are needed here in Southeast Alaska. And they don't, the big problem is right now, a lot of these mechanics are coming up from the lower 48. And uh, that is not the demographic that our minds uh, want to see in these these areas. They want people who are from Alaska, who have an intense relationship with the with the environment here. We need to be taking care of our land and our and our minds are are the place you know where we should get started doing that. And so I wanted to share today some information about the scholarship. Let you all know that you're all invited to apply. Uh, you should see a link there: uas.alaska.edu. 
forward slash career underscore ed uh, forward slash mining. And that should take you to a page which you can access the scholarship, more information, as well as, as my contact information. And so with that, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over now to my partner in crime here, Tyler McMichael, and he's going to briefly share some information about healthcare for you guys. Any questions, um, I invite you all to contact me. My name again is Casey Bain. I work uh, downtown Juneau at the UAS School of Career Education. You can reach me at cnbain at alaska.edu or by phone at 796-6427. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Casey. Uh, I apologize. I don't have my camera up having some technical difficulties there. But um, yeah, I appreciate the time here. Uh, Casey really kind of started this out well. We uh, do get driven by a lot. And I think more, more so than not realizing that um, the tech center downtown across from the high school is a place where you can get uh, educated for, you know, like diesel and construction work. Uh, I think people forget that you can also go there to uh, do health science work. It's kind of these, uh, it's a dichotomy that people don't really think about. At least I didn't think that there would be, um, you know, a lab and nursing uh, things in that building, but that is where it's housed in Juneau. That's where the health science um, you know, facilities is. And uh, I'll be on the top floor. If you guys ever just wander in there, uh, the top floor is kind of where that happens. Uh, it's a two-story building. So uh, that's where I'll be. And uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the opportunities that we have there. And the thing about the health field is the healthcare field is um, with everything going on, it's always been a lucrative uh, job opportunity, but the demand right now is so high. And the demand is, is also uh, cater towards people who care about their communities. Um, you know, the, the, just like with mining or, or, or another vocational job, um, there is this emphasis on we want community members serving their community. We want them to care about the people and places that they're at. And so there is a huge need right now for a lot of healthcare workers. And uh, the, the entry into the healthcare field is, is actually not as overwhelming as a lot of people tend to think. Uh, what we offer at uh, Career Education is a few different ways that you can do that. Uh, one of the, the most, I would say, effective ways that you can enter the healthcare field is as a CNA, a certified nurse aide. Um, and right now, certified nurse aides are in incredible demand. You'll get hired pretty much right away. Uh, it's not very often that you can make that promise to somebody. It takes a semester. You get fully educated and certified as a nurse aide. And you go and work in facilities like Barlet and Wildfire Court and even opportunities that are a little bit more non-traditional, like going and giving housing assistance or in care, um, you know, like in-home care and the flexible schedules and everything. And I, and I believe the starting hourly pay for a lot of CNAs is, is around that $20 to $25 an hour range, which, which is a great entry into that. And uh, like I said, flexible hours and so that is a program that we, we run every semester. We're starting to offer it in the summer as well. We take 10 students into the CNA program. There's opportunities to get it funded. Um, there's lots of community opportunities for that. I don't, I'm not really sure how Sea Alaska uh, might help with that funding, but there's always, there's always opportunities to get funded. People want CNAs into the community and it, it's a great opportunity. Um, along with the CNA, we also have EMTs. Those are always in high demand. Those are a little bit more of a specific kind of job. It's gonna be a little bit more um, intense, but also uh, a, a job that you're going to get educated and then go to work right away. And you'll be in this healthcare field environment, which is very attractive to people because the limit once you enter that field is, is very high. The ceiling is very high. You, you, you work your way up and, and you start having more opportunities. Uh, the other path that is very popular that we serve here uh, for students is becoming a nurse. Um, that is kind of an end goal for a lot of people that want to get into the healthcare field. And it makes sense because um, I think there the number says 68,000, but I think for most nurses I'm talking to now, they're getting job offers before they even get done licensed. I mean, they're, they're almost finished with their nursing education. They're getting job offers and those offers are coming in you know, seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year. You know, walking in type money, and uh, so we offer at UAS um, a pre-nursing certificate and a, an associate's degree with a pre-nursing emphasis that prepares you to enter into a nursing school, specifically the School of Nursing in Anchorage, where you can get a two-year nursing degree from Juno. You don't have to fly to Anchorage, 
and enter into the nursing field um, and, and be doing really well, really quickly. And I just wanna say these opportunities that we have are accessible. They're easy to get started in. And uh, what you really need is somebody to help you. Uh, someone like me to help you get started and to know what first steps you need to take. And I wish uh, somebody would have given me this information when I um, was younger and looking for careers, because this would have been something I would have greatly appreciated. So, uh, and then again, my contact is displayed here, Tyler McMichael, and uh, my number is 796-6128. And you can reach me at tjmcmichael at alaska.edu. Thank you. Thank you to everyone from UAX for being here and sharing about those opportunities with us today. And thank you to all of our shareholders for joining us. It's fun to see in the chat that you're all located all over the United States. So we appreciate you tuning in with us today. A couple of things to recap. We have our scholarships are open now. The deadline is March 1st. Those can be used for um, colleges, vocational schools, full-time, part-time for shareholders and descendants. So check out those opportunities. Our board youth advisor application is currently open until March 25th. This is a great way to get leadership experience and really learn more about your corporation. The PSO training that Sasha presented on will be February 17th and 18th. Um, the link will be in the chat and also as soon as I'm done, I'll put up a slide where you can scan it, scan the QR code to register. Um, for our shareholders, 1099s are available right now on mycelaska.com and those were also mailed on Friday. And we have an accounting internship opportunity still open. The deadline for the rest was on Monday, but we still have an opportunity in accounting. So if you know anyone, um, send them our way. We'd love to have them. And last, stay tuned for more events. We have two events that will be coming up. We have an event on policy, recapping all of the work that Sea Alaska is doing, um, talking about the land list, as I know something that we're all really interested in and passionate about. And we will have another shareholder opportunities event focused on youth and STEM opportunities. Our event last week was, post, or was focused more on post-secondary opportunities. And that event is now able to be viewed on mycelaska.com. This event will be put up there probably later today, but maybe tomorrow, as well as links to all the information that was shared today if you weren't able to catch it all. So um, again, thank you all for being here. Thanks for spending your afternoon with us. And let me put this screen up. <laughs>